help others join us, that is fine. Um, so thank you all for coming to our first advising workshop of the semester. Um, we just had this one, Advising 101, so I kind of mentioned to one of the advisors up here that we're going to kind of cover what we go over with the student org officers that come to our student org um, orientation. Come on in. Um, at the beginning of the fall semester. So I thought it was beneficial that you all hear um, what they hear and so that you uh, hopefully are starting off the semester with them um, on a good foot. So um, and I guess I didn't introduce myself, but I'm Kelly Jorgensen, the coordinator for student organizations. Um, this is Gina over here. She's my graduate assistant. So she works very closely with me and with um, all of the organizations as well, doing different things. Um, and feel free to ask me questions as we go. I like to just answer them as we go. So don't hesitate uh, to ask me anything. Right. Um, so these are some of the things we're going to cover today. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the qualifications to become a registered student organization, some benefits once those organizations do become registered. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the policies and procedures that we go over with our student organizations. Um, we're going to brief, just touch briefly on risk management. Um, we're going to talk about event planning and some of those pieces through the event application for sync that are beneficial for you all to know. Um, we're going to talk about funding opportunities for the organizations and um, fi some financial pieces. Uh, we're going to just briefly look at OrgSync so I can give you all a few um, tips and tricks and just some things that we go over with organizations through OrgSync. Um, and then just some additional resources that uh, we let the student organizations know about and I also want all of you to know about um, for them, uh, to encourage them to take, a part, uh, take part in and also just things that uh, advisors will have for this semester. Um, so the first thing is qualifications. Um, so organizations must register every long semester, fall and spring. Um, in the fall, they need to update their profile on OrgSync, have that approved by all of you as your, their advisor, and they also need to send an officer to student org orientation. Um, we do have some specialized orientations for our Greek life groups. Come on in. Um, for our Greek life groups, our sport clubs, um, and we also do a special orientation for our engineering organizations over at Discovery Park to make that more convenient for them. Um, so if your organization is a sport club organization or a Greek life organization, so one of those Greek groups that are with ISC, MPHD, MDC, or PLM, um, they do have a specialized orientation session that they go to. Um, in the spring, as long as the organization has become registered, uh, the only thing that they have to do is update that profile on OrgSync and have you approve it as their advisor. So orientation is essentially a one-time per academic year requirement for registration. Uh, they must maintain at least eight members, all of whom must be UNT students. Um, I ask that you all make sure that we, um, that all of our organizations are following this. We do have some organizations that take, like to work with other local universities, which is great. Um, but those members cannot, or those students cannot be members of the organization. They cannot vote. They cannot hold hold office. Um, and I'd also be, you know, very wary of them, you know, coming and hanging out at meetings and things um, because there are some liability that goes into that with them not being UNT students. Um, so we do let them all know that they do need to be UNT students, and if they want to work with those organizations um, at other universities, they're free to do that. You know, if they want to co-sponsor and do an event or something. Um, every organization must also have at least two officers, uh, and we do have eligibility requirements for those officers coming in. Um, and so all of those officers must meet a 2.4 UNT cumulative GPA. Uh, they must be enrolled in a certain number of hours, depending on if they're undergrad or grad, and they also must be in good disciplinary or conduct standing. Um, so some of you may have received an email from me recently. Um, what we do is after, after the organizations become registered, um, we use the information that they put about each officer and org sync to run a report to check, to check their eligibility. Um, and if they do not meet one of those requirements, they, as well as you as, as the advisor, receive an email letting um, them know that. Um, at that time, they can either resign or if they wish to appeal, they can do that. Um, there's a form at the bottom um, of the email that directs them directly to a form on OrgSync for them to fill out, and that's the appeals form. Um, and they do need to do that within seven business days of them being notified. Um, at that point, they will then be contacted. Um, some, of our, some of our students will actually come and meet directly with the Eligibility Appeals Committee, and some of our students um, will get an email just directly letting them know that we've either granted that appeal or denied that appeal. Um, based on a var varying factors. 
Um, so this is a process that we do do at the beginning of each semester. So um, like I said, we ran our first report. We got most of our organizations done in that first report. So some of you um, may have received an email about those. Um, as far as your role within that, um, if they wish to talk to you about it, you can definitely do that. Um, I am not allowed to tell you specifically what um, their what requirement they have not met. Um, if they share that with you, obviously you can talk about that with them. Um, my your role in it mostly is to make sure that um, if they're appealing, um, you follow up. Make sure that if they're granted an appeal, um, you know obviously they can remain an officer. If they're not. Uh, that they do remove themselves from the officer position um, and you will always be copied on all those emails and be get a heads up about what is happening um, or if they do not wish to appeal that you just make sure that they are resigning um, in, a, in a I guess an adequate amount of time um, I get questions about well, what should we say to the organization um, that's really up to the student what they would like to tell the organization um, we hope that they'll be up front and just say that, hey, you know, I don't fulfill the requirements for this position at this time, or I cannot fulfill these duties at this time. That would be, you know, completely fine if they just state those kind of um, answers and at that time just remove themselves from that position. Was there any questions about that? Because I know we did have some questions since this recently just kind of happened. Okay, so that is um, a process that we go through at the beginning of each semester. Um, and then the last requirement for um, them to be registered is for them to be a full-time faculty or staff advisor, to have a full-time faculty or staff advisor with all of you. Um, so our organizations do have, um, have to have lists of each, at least one advisor, but we also do have some organizations who list a secondary advisor. Um, so some of you may fill that role as well. I do have a question. Yes. Um, an officer who is not eligible. Yes. So can we do like an election or sort of a... Yes. And what I would suggest bill? is looking, looking at the constitution that the organization has. Um, I, we have a sample constitution that you can use if you do not have um, a section about removal of officers or re-election or those kind of things. We do have a sample constitution that I would go and check out. Um, but yes, I would say if it's a position that you need within your organization, yes, I would have a special election and do that soon. Um, if you're coming up on your election process in the next month or two and you want to wait, that is fine as long as the organization still has at least two officers. Um, so that's kind of up to the organization to decide. Um, but I would just follow whatever procedures the organization has listed in their constitution. Okay, perfect. All right, so updating our sync profile. Um, so these are some of the things that we um, want to make sure the organizations are updating each semester because this is the information we have and the most updated, and we want them to update this information each semester, I guess. Um, so the first thing is the number of active members. We want to know how many active members they have in their organization so we know how many um, people are a part of our organizations here at UNT. Um, make sure that when they're putting in your information that everything is correct. Um, we use this information to contact you. Um, by email and phone, and we want to know which departments you're on in, so make sure that they're entering your information correctly, um, and then make sure that they're also entering a name, title, UID, and email of all of their officers. If I see that any of that information is missing, um, I contact them right away and ask them to add that, because like I said, we use this for eligibility checks. Um, we use this to contact different officers about workshops and trainings we have, so we'll co contact all the treasurers about you know, our SOAP workshop where we do treasurers training, um, so we want to make sure that all that information is correct. And if you see that, hey, I know this student has graduated, or I know this student's no longer an officer, and maybe the organization just didn't go in um, and you know add those add those new officers in, or didn't remove those old officers, um, please let them know. Please deny the profile. That's totally fine. You can deny the profile. Let them know they need to make edits, and they can do that and resubmit. Uh, the last thing that we did tell organizations about their constitution this semester is, I'm sure you all know, or most of you probably know that the policy numbers at the university changed within the last year. So that means our student organization policy number changed. Um, and that a lot of times is um, inside of the organization's constitution that is mentioned in the constitution. Um, so that as well as some of the verbatim clauses that we require in each of the constitution were things that we wanted to make sure every student org had included. Um, so we told them that this at the beginning of this registration period. Um, some of them are still working on that, so if you've seen your organization, hey, we need to make some updates to the Constitution, this is probably why. Um, and I'd also make sure that you're looking at the sample Constitution and bylaws that we have on our website 
um, with your organization to make sure you have a clause about removing officers or special elections or things like that that may come up in the semester um, so that you have a process and procedure to follow when those things do occur. Um, anyone that's going to update the profile does have to be an administrator in the portal. Um, so I would, uh, we tell our organizations, make sure that you're including this process within the transition period. So when you're moving from officer to officer, include org sync as something that you are transitioning that new officer in um, and making sure that they have access to the portal. So making sure that they are an administrator in the portal. Some of you may be administrators in your organization's portal as well and can give those permissions um, to those new officers or members who are for whoever it may be that need access. Um, so I'll show you all when we go through a little tutorial of org sync. Um, where you can change that, so if you need to, you can help the organization with that. So, um, and then I guess if anything comes up within the semester, we ask the organizations to keep their uh, profile updated. So, if someone did, um, you know, you did have an officer who's maybe ineligible and they're no longer going to be an officer, make sure that that information is being removed. Make sure if a new officer is replacing them, that that person's information is getting added. Um, and that they're just keeping things updated throughout the semester, so we are contacting um, the correct people. Um, so these are just a few of the benefits that registered student organizations get once they re um, become registered for the semester. Um, so just a, a few things for you all to note. Um, the first is, and the one that's always most important to our organizations, is that, is that they're able to make room reservations. Um, and hold, hold events here on campus. So um, that's probably the biggest one to all of them is until they're actually registered, we will not book any spaces for them or allow them to hold events here on campus. Um, so that is the biggest one. Uh, they are able to participate in university-sponsored events, so Mean Green Flame, Mean Green Spring Flame, Homecoming, or Orientation Fairs in the summer. Um, I would definitely encourage them to take advantage of all those um, opportunities to table and get new members and talk to others um, about their organization when they can. Uh, they do appear in org sync when they're registered, so essentially what happens is that September 8th deadline that we had a couple weeks ago, um, after that deadline, any of our organizations who had not registered to that point, um, their category in org sync was changed to unregistered, and at that time they are no longer searchable in the database. Um, they are allowed to still continue to register through our November 10th deadline, um, but that's just really our initial deadline to get them going and getting them registered. Um, and to get them so that they are searchable in the database um, and to be able to take advantage of these benefits. Um, so just know that if your organization does fail to register by that first deadline, um, they will not appear in the database until they do become registered. Um, opportunity co program with university departments. Uh, they do have access to a free website through OrgSync, so we tell all of our organizations that if you need you know, more marketing uh, materials or more, you want to have a more social media presence, internet presence, um, there is an option for them to set up a free website <coughs> or sync. Uh, they do have a limited quantity of free black and white copies. Um, they can bring one copy to student activities and we will make up to 100 copies per semester for their organization. Um, they are black and white, but um, a lot of times we'll have organizations come in with meeting minutes or things that they want copied, so they can take advantage of that. And then the ability to invite guest speakers and bring others to campus um, for events. Um, a few of the other places, or I guess um, benefits, is they do get to use this great space in Union 337, the student org workspace. Um, so this is a space for student organizations. So they come in, uh, there's a desk right at the entrance. They just sign in with their name and what organization they're there on behalf of. And they're able to use any of these tables, chairs, um, and desk spaces in this area. Um, it's not a reservable space, you can't take claim to it, but um, we do encourage our organizations to utilize this space if they just need a few, you know, have a few members or a few officers who need to come in and meet um, about something going on with the organization. Um, I always tell them that there's a fireplace in the way back, so that's like the great, the great place to go check out is in the way back. Um, so, and you all are free, obviously, to come um, and check out this space as well. Um, and then if it's after hours, they can use the space just by checking into the information desk on level two. So the next thing we have is another benefit is for, is we do have student org lockers. Um, so if any of our organizations have materials that they need to store, um, so they're not carrying them around campus, uh, we do have an application process for these once the organization becomes registered. So we open these up um, when registration basically begins every fall. Um, and they are still open right now because we have a, a few split size open. Um, so if they are assigned one, they're given it for the entire school year. If they're given one key, um, that they can 
you know, pass around to officers or members if they wish um, who may need access to it. Um, and then they will return that key and check out of that locker um, at the end of the spring semester. Um, so we've got the two sizes in there in our org workspace and they're also down a hallway um, in kind of a student, it's like a student org, student org closet I think it's called, um, near the Pride Alliance office. Um, so we have these available for our organizations as well. All right, and just a few policies and procedures. These are the ones that we go over with our organizations um, during orientation, so I just wanted you all to be um, familiar with them as well. So the first is signs, posters, and ads. Um, so there are designated spaces that uh, you can hang signs, posters, and ads. The majority of these um, are put up in different bulletin board spaces within the buildings. Um, I always just tell our organizations, rule of thumb um, is if you see a space and you're not unsure, you're unsure if you should post there, ask the building rep, ask the building manager before you post it or know that it could be taken down. The majority of the bulletin board spaces are um, usable for all of our student organizations. So that is an option for them. Um, a few things that they're not allowed to do are um, chalking is one of the biggest things. We cannot chalk on campus. Um, and then if taping flyers to any light poles, trees, um, windows, or doors. So, um, I always tell them, I know you're going to see them on campus, but facilities um, will take them down, so just don't waste the sign or poster by putting it on those spaces um, and follow those rules. So um, that's one of the uh, policies that we go over with them. I always tell them that um, lawn signs are a great marketing, um, I guess, I guess marketing tool. Um, so if they have some funding, they can get those printed at Eagle Enterprise or Design Works in the Union, and they can also purchase the stakes from there. Um, they can pretty much put them anywhere on campus except for not in any garden or flower bed spaces um, and any kind of walkway where it's maybe blocking a car or someone from seeing down the next road. Um, but this is definitely uh, another option for them to market if they have a large event coming up or want to market a recruiting event um, to get new members. So this is an option for them as well. All right, uh, branding. Um, so I'm sure you all know that if you use the UNT logo or trademarks in any way that you do have to use that approved by URCM. So our student organizations have to do that as well. So if they're going to use uh, the UNT logo or any of the UNT trademarks on any of their print materials, their clothing, their buttons, their flyers, whatever it may be, um, they do have to get that approved. Um, so I always tell them they're not going to you know, make you use a specific vendor. They just want to make sure that you are using it in an appropriate way, You're using a high resolution logo. All of those great things. Um, and they can help, they can email brandery at unt.edu just like any of us could um, to get that approval. So um, make sure that if you see anything that they're maybe selling t-shirts or um, selling something that maybe has UNT logo or UNT trademarks on it, that they have gotten that approved by URCM. And if it says uh, the, the organization's name and underneath UNT, does that need to still to be approved by that? Uh, yeah, if they're going to use UNT in some of their wording, then yes, they should be getting that approved. About how long does it take, like, how to get that approval? Yeah. Um, I guess it's hard to say. When I use it, I I would say less than a week. I can usually get approval. Um, if they do send anything, if they're getting anything printed at Eagle Images, they automatically send it to your CM for approval. So if they use that means to get things printed, it automatically will go through this process. Um, but I would say within a week or so, they should be able to get approval. Yes? Um, what information would they need in order to, I guess, be approved? Like, do they need to know what is being printed on, or like what? Yes, yeah, so I would essentially, you know, if they're going to get a t-shirt printed, uh, I would have them send over the design and what's going to be used. Um, so basically whatever they would send to the company that they're going to get it printed at is probably what they would also send to yours. Alright, so the next thing is solicitation. Um, so if the organization is attempting to sell or distribute items, or I guess if anyone is really on campus, um, there is a solicitation policy and you have to have a solicitation permit on campus to do those things. Um, so this usually comes into play when our organizations are out tabling. Um, they're maybe handing out candy to, you know, encourage students to come over and hear more about their upcoming event, or um, they're maybe doing a fundraising activity. Um, so they do have to have a solicitation permit with them at that table. With whom? A solicitation permit? With whom? Uh, the student organization, when they're out there tabling or doing an event, or if they're going to hand out um, any anything, really. They have to have that permit with them. But the permit is requested to whom? Um, so it is through, so the solicitation policy and permit is through Union Scheduling Services. 
Um, and what happens is when they request that space through Donna Ritchie and Union Scheduling Services, she will also give them information of where to pick up their permit. So they actually pick it up in the student org workspace at that desk where they walk in. Um, they have to give their student ID and they'll get a little piece of paper that they'll take with them when they go tabling and or for an event out in the library mall where they may be handing out things. Um, so it's just a little piece of paper so that if anyone came by, we could double check and make sure that um, they were doing the things they needed to be doing and had permission to be out there um, and handing out those items. Um, so fundraising also comes into play with this policy. Um, so just some, so you all are aware, um, some activities that are not allowed. Um, raffles are not allowed in the state of Texas. Um, there are a very small few um, student organizations who may fall under, uh, who may have a 501c3 status that may be allowed to do raffles. Um, if you think your organization is one of those, um, we can chat about that, but I would say 99% of our organizations are not allowed to do raffles. Um, bake sales are another thing that we are not allowed to do. Um, so organizations cannot make their own food, make their own baked goods, um, and bring them onto campus and distribute that, and that's just to protect them. Um, and others in case anything happened. Um, and selling food is the other thing that is not allowed. So um, based on our agreement with Friday Catering, um, organizations cannot just sell food. Um, we have a lot of fundraising ideas on our website. We have a document. So I would um, encourage organizations to go to that document to get some ideas. Those are all things that we have pre-approved. Um, the biggest thing with fundraising is if they're going to do something, we ask that they um, you know, have signage. Tell us what you're going to, you know, if someone's going to donate money, where is it going to be going to? Is it going to be going to your organization or an event or a nonprofit? Um, where is it going to? And so that's one of the biggest things that we um, always have to tell organizations is that they need to display um, what their fundraiser is about. Um, so like I said, Union Scheduling Services is the one who um, is kind of the owner of that policy and those permits, the one who give those permits out. So um, they can provide any additional information. Um, and they're the ones who will get that approval for those organizations to, use, to go out and table and then get those permits. Um, so the last policy that we go through with them um, is the right to free speech and assembly. Um, so we do have free speech areas here on campus um, that organizations can utilize. Um, we just tell them that make sure that you are not interrupting um, any other students, classes, teachers, uh, professors, whatever it may be here on campus who um, you know, are here to educate um, others, so we tell them that if someone comes up to them, if they're, or we get a complaint that we may shut their event down or their tabling event down or whatever it may be, um, if we have gotten a complaint. Um, so if they are doing any of these things on the bottom here, if they're going to have amplified sound, if they're going to do a parade or march or have an outside structure, uh, they do have to have an additional approval uh, through their event application for that, and those are questions that we ask in the event application, so we make sure that um, we let them know the rules for each of those things. Um, so for amplified sound, there are certain times where they can play play music or have amplified sound out in the library mall. That's usually where they're, um, or in one of the housing outdoor spaces or one of the outdoor rec spaces. Um, so those are from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. during the week. Um, so any times outside of those blocks, they cannot have amplified sound. Um, and we have to do, this is something that has been, um, has become a bit of an issue. Um, and we've also had some organizations who have not abided by the 92 decibel limit. Um, so if you know your organization is going to be out in those spaces and have, have amplified sound, um, please let them know that they really need to follow these times. They cannot start a minute <laughs> earlier than 11.30. Um, and they cannot go a, you know, a minute past 1 p.m. because um, we have other colleges and you know, areas around that can hear that sound um, during those times. Um, so that's the first one, amplified sound. Um, if they're going to do a parade or march, we obviously want to know about that. Um, we will make sure that um, you know, there's police officers out there that can help them cross the street safely, for example. Um, and so there's going to obviously be some more conversation about that um, if that is an event they're choosing to do. Um, and then if they're bringing, having an outside structure. So a lot of times um, our organizations may bring, we have someone bring a dunk tank soon. Um, we'll have organizations who will bring out bikes and do fundraising um, events with bikes in the library mall area. So all of those kind of things were things we would need to know about their event. Um, and we will provide them with additional things that they'll need to follow um, in order to, one, stay safe. Um, two, we may ask them to rent some track mats to protect the grass, for example. Um, for those who are bringing a dunk tank, we'll obviously make sure that they get water so that they can fill up that dunk tank 
don't take. Um, so those are some examples of things that we would go through with them if they were doing any of those three things on the bottom. Um, the last thing we tell our organizations is obviously you can use any of those free speech areas, um, but you can also reserve them as well, most of them. Um, so they can do that through the event application um, and through Donna Ritchie and Union Scheduling Services. And I actually suggest that they do that so they make sure that they're kind of guaranteed that space and they're the only organization out there um, for that time. Any questions about that policy? Okay. I got one. Yes. So any, any kind of campus event or whatever, even though it says Union Scheduling Service, so if they're going to have something that would like over here in the, the Wooden parking lot, I'll say that okay. too. But they're going to have to go through Donna and all that. Um, so Donna is the one who schedules the library model, the soft lawn, and any of those free speech areas. Okay. Um, if it was a parking lot, we can't really reserve parking lots, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I just... um, yeah, so it kind of depends on where the area is. Um, we have some outside spaces that our residence halls okay. um, will allow orgs to use. Um, we have some rec sports areas. Um, so any of Depending on where they're at, there would maybe different people that they would reserve through. Okay, but um, Donna would be a good place to start. Yes, everything. yes. Yeah. I mean, I would say 95% of what the organizations are going to do, they're going to do in the library, and the <coughs> speech kind right. of area, self law. So, yes, yeah, she would okay. be a person to go through. Okay. Yeah. All right, and I just wanted to, um, so we actually provide all of our um, organizations risk management training. So we are required by um, Texas state law through the Texas Education Code um, to provide student org officers and advisors with risk management training on these eight different topics. Um, so depending on what your organization um, does, how risky it may be, some of you have maybe gone through this training. Um, some of you, I may be asking you to go through this training soon. I have not reached out to everyone about um, doing this risk management training, which is just a video and a quiz afterwards. Uh, but we actually provide um, a video to all of our student org officers who attend student org orientation so that basically we just cover all our grounds and every student organization has heard this information whether they are a more risky organization or not. Um, so we actually show them this video. It's the same video that you would watch um, if you have to do the training online. Um, and then we also ask that they bring all the information back from this video to the full membership of their organization so that all the other members are also aware um, of this law and of these eight topics and some of the things that are um, risky to student works. So I just want you all to be aware of that. Um, so right now we are probably providing this training to all of our student works at this time. Um, so the uh, video that we watched with them uh, talks specifically about the event, the event application and also the event safety committee that we have um, for any events that may be deemed a little more risky. Um, so I wanted to go over a few things with you all about that. Um, so if they're going to hold any events or do anything on campus here and need to make a room reservation, they do need to go through the event application on Work Sync. Um, and I'm sure most of you, has, has everyone approved an event on Work Sync for the most part? Okay, I think everyone probably for the most part has. Um, so you've all seen um, that event application come through. So it asks a variety of questions so we can get more information about their event. Um, and then based on how they ask those questions, different, or different reviewers um, are selected to approve and or deny that event. Um, so I wanted to just, these are a few tidbits that we give our organizations that I also wanted to um, let you all know about. So the person that fills out that event application is who we consider the event contact. Sometimes that is not the president, sometimes that's not always even an officer. Um, so be aware of who that person is if you ever have questions about that event app or if you need to know more specific information that they put in that event application. Um, we always tell them to check their MindMT email. So if you see that maybe they're not responding to any questions in the event application that we have asked, they possibly are not checking their MindMT email address, but that is what is connected to their OrgSync profile. Um, so we let them know that you need to check your mind you need the email address um, and then every event app that they submit, you as the advisor and the president will also need to approve all of those event applications. Um, if you all are not okay with those events, obviously we're not going to move forward with booking them. Um, so we want your approval first and essentially we don't even um, really look at them until we see, we've seen that you and the president have both approved. <coughs> Another thing to mention is um, if the president is the one who submits the event application, we get a lot of questions about um, why well, I submitted it and I don't know why things are moving. They do still need to go in and actually hit that approve button so we get that approval check mark. Um, <coughs> or sync, unfortunately, is not smart enough to know that they are the ones who submitted the event and then they're also the president of the organization. Um, so we also 
tell them that they need to go through that email, same type of email that you all received, like the one on the right here, um, to also approve. Um, I would encourage your organization, so uh, we do request the 15 business day, uh, 15 business days to process the event. Uh, so because we have so many, um, and because we don't know exactly what all of the events are going to entail and how many um, approvers and reviewers there may be for the event, for the, each event, uh, we ask that they submit them at least 15 business days prior to their event so that, um, and that's with you already approving by those 15 business days. So basically that gives everyone else to then go in um, and approve, um, make those room reservations if they need to meet with the event safety committee because their event is a little more risky. That gives us time to do that because that takes some time as well. Um, so please encourage them to make sure that they're submitting things as early as possible. Um, so that we can make sure that all of those reviewers have enough time to get to them. Uh, the other thing is um, we ask that they provide as much detail as possible. So if there are specific things that are going to be happening within their, their event um, that they're not able to ask us in, or they're not able to answer through those questions that we provide in the event application, there's a box at the end that they can add additional information. Um, it basically just says, like, tell us any information that you weren't able to tell us in the previous questions. Um, so we've had some organizations who are maybe having conferences here on campus and they need to have five classrooms booked at one time. Um, so things like that where maybe you can't answer that or can't, I guess, specify that in the questions above. Um, encourage them to use that box to really put in those extra details about those events. Um, the other thing is to just provide other options for location, dates, and times. Um, and I guess I would encourage you all when you're approving to look through and see if they've provided some other example or other options. <coughs> what we do is we try to obviously give them their first option, but if it's not available, we kind of work through the list and just work down to the second and third or fourth. Um, and if they don't provide us with more than one or two options um, and it's not available, then we have to reach back out to them. Um, and that just takes more time. Um, and especially if they're not submitting with, you know, close to that 15 business day deadline, then we're going to be cutting it close to getting to uh, book that space um, for that event. So if they can, um, encourage them to be kind of flexible in those dates and times. And um, also encourage them not to market their event widely. Um, you know, with a specific room and tell that they, they've known that it is available and that they have that room booked. Um, we have had cases where people have said, hey, well, we already marketed for this space and it was not available during the time that they had put it on their flyers. Um, so also encourage them to kind of wait and make sure that they have the space um, and date and time that they want before they're marketing out to others. Um, so the last day to hold an event this semester is December 5th. So organizational activities cannot happen during um, pre-finals, uh, finals, pre-finals, greeting day, and finals days. Um, so this will be the last day that any organization can um, do anything. Have a meeting, um, meet as officers, an exec board meeting, have any type of event. Um, they should not be doing anything after this date. Um, so please make sure that they're not meeting after. Um, they may not, you know, if they don't put in an event application but you know they're meeting, please reach out to them. Tell them, hey, you need to follow this policy. They're, obviously, we want them to be studying and um, preparing for finals, so that is why we have this policy in place. Um, any questions about the event application or any of those things? So yes? If it's an off-campus fundraiser, Correct. do you need to do this? No, you do not. Um, okay. So the one option that you can do is if they want to market the event to others, so if they want people to see that, hey, we're doing this off-campus event, um, they can just fill out that first page of the event application, um, which kind of gives brief details about the event, and then when the second page comes up and they're asked if they need to make a room reservation, they would just say no, and the event application would end at that point, and they would go through the rest of it. Um, so that is an option if they would like to put that kind of on their calendar in WorkSync for others to see, they can do that. Um, uh, so we have a few funding um, opportunities that we let all of our organizations know about. Um, and I also want you to all know about these opportunities so that you can encourage them to take advantage of them. Um, so the first is Eagle's Nest funding. Um, so this is funding that they can um, ask for through a student government association and or is there any um, advisors here for graduates and graduate student organization? No. Okay. So all of the undergrad organizations would go through student government association. Um, so this would be to um, help an organization uh, with any funding that they may need for a program or service or event or something that they're having here on campus that is open to the entire UNT community. Um, so if they are having something large on campus and you think, you know, hey, 
know, you could apply for this funding, ask for this funding. Um, this is something that they could uh, ask for. Um, the other is the route travel grant. Uh, so if an organization is traveling for a conference or a competition, uh, they could also get potentially get funding for that. Uh, they can get funding for up to four officers or members of an organization. Um, and I'm not quite sure about what the totals are this from this semester, but um, I think last semester it was like over three thousand dollars that they could get uh, for up for for those four members or officers. So it's quite a bit of money that they could get to assist them if they would like to go to a conference or competition. Both of these processes um, are through SGA. They have forms that work sync that they. Um, need to fill out and they also have a lot of information on their website about this as well and I would also encourage them you know if they have specific questions to reach out to SGA they can email them directly at sga.unt.edu um, they also have these have resource meetings that an organization officer uh, would need to attend prior to submitting the form where they will get a lot of additional information uh, about the process as well so these are two funding opportunities that they can take advantage of the other is Student Organization uh, of the Month. So through student activities, uh, we award Student Organization of the Month three times in the fall and three times in the spring semester. Um, so if an organization, if you know, if they've done, you know they've done something really great and they want to be recognized for that, um, encourage them to fill out this form on OrgSync. Um, the first one was due the 15th of September, so we're going to get ready to award um, an organization here soon, and we always put that out in our Student Org newsletters. Um, and that's something that we're going to include in your um, correspondence as well, so you um, will know if your organization has uh, received this award. Um, and what they get is a $100 co-sponsorship that they can use towards their organizational activities. Um, so essentially, student activities will pay up to $100 to help them with maybe marketing or advertising materials, or they're going to have an event in the union will maybe help them pay for their AV tech or their catering. Um, so those are some things that we've done in the past for organizations. So um, encourage them to fill this out if they have been uh, doing some really great things and want to be recognized for it. Um, all right, and then we're going to talk about some financial pieces. Um, so I know that there is some confusion about checking accounts and um, things uh, of that nature. So um, your organization does not need to have a checking account if they are not handling money in any kind of way. Are there any organizations who are not who do not have an account? Okay, so if they're not handling money in any way. Um, they don't need to have one. They're not required to open one. Um, if they are handling money, they need to open an account. Um, we want to make sure that those funds are being handled properly um, and an officer or member is not um, liable for having, you know, holding all of that money, whether it's cash, checks, or whatever it is, and that everything is um, handled properly. So if they are handling money, please make sure that they open an account. Um, so that is the process here on the left if they need to open one. Um, for those organizations that have an account already, uh, we do help those organizations, especially those who work with Wells Fargo, to get those officers changed from um, from semester to semester, if the officers change, I guess, from the account. Um, so the first thing that they have to do is someone currently on the account needs to fill out the checking account verification request form on OrgSync. Um, this is one way of us making sure that who's being added um, is being approved by someone who's already on the account. Um, Basically, they'll fill in information, they'll add in who they want to add and remove as officers and as advisors. Um, so if you wish to be on the account, that is an option. Um, and then at that point, once they submit that form, it'll ask for the president and the um, advisor to approve. Uh, it's kind of our second check of making sure these people are actually, should be added to the account. Um, and then once we verify that everything looks correct, um, Gina actually has been working on them this year, so she will send over a PDF letter uh, to the email address that was um, entered into that form, and then they can take that PDF letter directly to the bank to make that change. Um, so I know a lot of the advisors are a part of that process. Um, make sure that they are including this in their transition documents as well. We do run into instances where, hey, you know, like we don't have anyone left on campus, and like we don't know how to get access to this account. Um, so these are things that we want to make sure that they're including um, in their transition so that they're giving over um, access to those next officers who are going to need it. Yes? And can I assume that everything is good if I haven't heard from anyone in regards to the verification or do I need to somehow check whether that has been done for my organization? Um, I would reach out to those officers and just make sure that they have access to the account and if they do not um, someone currently on the account will need to fill out that form if they need if they need to get access. 
Um, this isn't something that we will seek out the organization about. We essentially will, they'll come to us and say, hey, we need to make this switch. So if there is no access, that means that this needs to be done. But if there, correct. If there is access, it is good. Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. Who and how many is in the only account? Um, we do not have a maximum number. I'm not sure if Wells Fargo does. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that there should at least be two to three officers, at least I would suggest having three officers on the account at a time, and then if the advisor wants to be on, that would be fine. Um, just so, you know, if someone is not available or whatever, there's multiple people who could go and access the account if they need to, um, but we don't have any minimum or maximum amount. And it is Wells Fargo that all this go through? Um, so yes, so the majority of organizations use Wells Fargo. If an organization comes to us and needs assistance from an account somewhere else, we can attempt to do that. Um, and we can attempt to work with them and create a letter. Um, but Wells Fargo is obviously the one that we have a relationship with um, because they're there in the union and that I would say probably 95% of our organizations use just because it's convenient. Okay. Yes. Does it still need to follow the rules of like a regular, I guess like a regular like, personal account, like to have a certain amount in it every month or? Yes, so um, there are some, it, it follows Wells Fargo's checking account um, rules. So yes, there is a minimum amount that they have to have in the account if they open a certain type of account. Um, we do have a document on our website that compares, I think it's four financial institutions in the area and the different accounts that they could open and what they would need the requirements to be. Um, we have had a few issues with Wells Fargo with some organizations who just don't have a lot of money and they haven't been able to meet that minimum. Um, so that would be something before they open an account, make sure they understand, you know, they need to always have this amount in if that's the requirement for that account that they're opening. Um, but they do vary. Okay, and is it like a personal account or is it like a commercial account? Like what so essentially they, they when they go and, um, sign up for this tax ID number, is they're essentially signing up for, um, I can't think of the exact wording when they um, ask for it, but it's, it's on behalf of the student organization. So they're getting, they're not using like a personal uh, tax ID number, um, it's on behalf of the organization, if that makes sense. Our organization makes a false cargo and is a business account. Um, they do require that we have $150 in there at all times, and what we do is we just transfer $150 into our savings every month, and then a day later, switch it back to our church. Yes, so, so that's required. That yes, that's what we'll get how they've gotten their own. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing that we talk with our organizations about is taxes and exemption. Um, and so this comes up a lot when our organizations are going out and fundraising or asking for donations. Um, so, as a, they are not, since the organizations are not part of the university, they are not automatically tax exempt. Um, obviously, if there's any organizations that have a national or state affiliate, they more than likely can use that status um, and are tax exempt, but a lot of our organizations are not. Um, so, what we tell our organizations is um, if they are wanting to go out and ask for donations, make sure that they let the business know that they're not tax exempt. If the business is not want to give them those donations because of that, because they can't write that off on their taxes, um, what we can do is we can provide, student activities can provide, provide them with a letter that basically just says, they're a group of students not operating for a profit here at you know, the University of North Texas, and a lot of times that letter will um, be sufficient enough for the business to then give them those donations um, and use that to write, off, to write off those donations on their taxes. Um, so the biggest thing is just to remember um, how many organizations we have that maybe have a state or national affiliate here, any? Okay, so they more than likely can use that status, like I said, um, so make sure that they're reaching out to that state or national affiliate about that. Um, and then is there any other, is there any organizations who are bringing in more than $5,000 annually? No? Okay. <laughs> Some it, there's a few who do, um, but that would be in a situation where we would um, want them to be paying federal income taxes, so there would be a further discussion um, about that. Most of our organizations do not fall into line with that, but there are a few that do, um, so we have to make sure that they're obviously following um, those same federal laws and um, abiding by those um, rules. So, biggest thing to remember is just make sure that if they're going out and asking for donations, that, um, that they're letting business know, businesses know they're not tax exempt. Um, and if they're having uh, issues asking for those donations, that they can come to us and we can write them, provide them with, an, with that letter. Okay, so we're just going to look at OrgSync for a couple minutes here. Um, so I can just show you all a few things. 
that um, we see as issues every year. Um, so the first thing that we tell our organizations is when they sign in, um, we don't have any right now, but we do technically, we usually have um, some banners up here at the top, and those are all our student org events, um, deadlines, applications that are open, um, just things that are going on that are very student org uh, based, and so we always encourage our student orgs to make sure you're double checking that, make sure you're not missing out um, on signing up for anything or any big event that's coming up that they could take advantage of. Um, if any of you ever fill out a form um, or submit a registration renewal, if you uh, end up doing that for some uh, one of the organizations, uh, the thing that I want to point out is uh, your personal profile over on the right. If you scroll down and you go to um, activity, you can actually see everything that you've ever um, completed, filled out, uh, what the status is of it. Um, so this is something that you can also tell the organizations as well if they're, you know, worried about, hey, I submitted this form and I can't find it, I don't know the status of it, um, they can always go and look to see everything that they've ever submitted. Um, so there's forms here. Uh, same thing for event applications. So if they submit an event application, they're going to see all of those that they've submitted there, and they're going to see if they've been approved, denied, pending, um, and same with registration and renewals as well. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to show you all a few things using, we'll just use SGA's portal here. So every organization has their own portal. Um, a few of the big things that we tell our organizations is, um, the first thing is the profile tab here. Um, this is an abbreviated portion of the profile that they submit for registration um, each semester. So this, is, this information here is all public information. So these are the things that they really need to make sure are accurate um, and are portraying their organization in the, way, the way they want it to. Because we send all of our um, students who are looking to get involved to OrgSync and tell them to search these organizations and go to their profiles to see more information about them. Um, so these things are all public here. So you know their website, their social media, um, their requirements for membership, and um, also their meeting dates and times. So I would you know encourage them if these things are not updated that they update them um, as soon as possible so that those new students know how to get involved with their organization. Uh, your information as a primary advisor, your name and email, as well as the president's name and email are also public information, so I want you all to be aware of that as well. Um, so if you do get a random email from maybe a student um, asking you about the organization you advise, they may have just clicked on your name and um, are reaching out, out to you to get more information. Um, so we also do tell our organizations if you, know, if you can't tell from their profile how to get involved or where their meetings are, um, you can reach out to the you know, we suggest the president, but obviously if they reach out to you all, um, they may get, uh, try to get information from that as well. Um, so, and if you know that the president doesn't check the email on here, this is the email that we use for all of our correspondence. Um, so, let them know that, hey, if your preferred email isn't the my.unt.edu my email, they are able to put in a Gmail email or um, another option, so I'd encourage them to do that as well. And then if they need to update the profile at any time during the semester, clicking this Manage Profile button right here is where they can do that and um, make any of those updates as long as they're an administrator in the portal. In the portal. And where does it have the administrators? Um, so that is our next tab. Um, no, you're perfect. You're getting there. Um, so the People's tab. Um, so this is the tab that you as advisors um, probably need to help um, our organizations make sure they're managing. Um, so, the first thing is, if someone is not in the portal, the first thing that they can do is they can click on people, click invite people, and this is actually going to just allow them to type in an email, um, suggesting they put in their MyUT email because it's connected to their OrgSync uh, profile. They can send a message if they want, and then they can just choose whatever group within the portal that they would like to add um, for that person to be added to. So if they need to add this person to the administrator's group, uh, they can do that, hit submit, that person will get an email asking them to invite to join the portal. Once they accept, they will automatically be in that group that they're asked to join. Um, so if officers uh, need to be added, that is the one way that they can be added to the portal. Um, if they are already a part of the portal, but they just need um, different permissions, you can essentially just scroll down, we're just going to choose Barrett here, click on their name, um, click on this blue manage button and check whatever group they need to be a part of. 
Um, so if you are a part of those portals, you can help do this if they need access. Um, so that would be how you would give them administrative permissions. Um, other things that they can do is if they want to just click, you know, a couple, obviously Barrett's an administrator, so she has everything checked. Um, but we tell them, you know, if you have an officer who just wants to, or just is going to need to fill out the event application, for example, they could just check events, and that would be the only permission that that person had. Um, so this is a portion that we, um, we obviously don't require them to add all the officers and members to the portal, but we encourage them to add as many people as possible. And obviously any of those officers that are going to need to be, you know, updating the profile, filling out event applications, or filling out any forms for the organization should be a member um, of the portal here. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, events. So this is where they actually go right here to the right to fill out the event application. Um, it's just this little green button right here. Once they click on it, um, it looks, this is the calendar portion that I was talking about when she had asked if they just want to do something off campus and have kind of a calendar portion. Um, they would just fill out this first page here, just kind of ask some brief details about uh, the event. When they hit create, a, create event, that's going to take them to the rest of the event application that they fill out. Um, so encourage them or I guess this is where it's located if they ever ask you any questions, it's exclusively here on our sink in their portal. Um, they have an option to store files here if they'd like, so that's an option for them. Um, forms, uh, anything that they may need to fill out for student activities, so the checking account verification form, um, if they want to sign up for a storage locker, if they want to fill out the student organization of the month form, all of those forms are located under their portal in forms, they just need to go there to fill them out. Um, and anything student activities related is also going to have an umbrella next to it. Is that where they, when they're um, appealing, is that where that form is? Or is that form? Um, so it is not under their portal, so they're going to have to go from the direct, direct link from their email because it's actually under the student activities program. Yes. Um, and then obviously if they wanted to create a form, they could do that as well. Our organization, they're starting to use this to create applications for maybe exec boards or officer applications um, rather than using paper. Um, this is a great option for them to do those, create those on here as well. Um, they have all of these options as things that are optional in their portal. Uh, one of them is website, which I had mentioned. If, uh, so if they want to create a website, they can do that through OrgSync here, and it just provides them with a bunch of template elements that they can um, put together to create a free website. Um, the last thing I'll mention about OrgSync over here in the settings and org settings, um, the third one here, permissions. So all of these blue things are the things that I just talked about, and they're all called modules, and they're optional. Um, so I just tell all the organizations, make sure that you're going through um, and selecting things that you want to use, um, disabling things that you don't want to use. So for example, if your organization doesn't collect dues, um, then I would just scroll down to dues and disable those, and those won't even appear on their portal. Um, so there's going to be some organizations where you know, this more, there may only be two things because everything else that they've disabled. And that is totally fine. Um, so they can really customize it to what they need to use. Does that text messaging module work? Uh, yes. As long as everyone has their phone number and their profile and their personal profile, and whoever is a part of the portal can receive a text message. Yes, there's also some email options as well. Um, the other thing I also mentioned to them is joint options. So we'll get some organizations who don't know how to um, join the portal or don't know how users are joining their portal. And it's because someone has chosen one of these options. Um, joining with a password always becomes an issue, so I would suggest um, not selecting that um, or encouraging the organization to not select that uh, because they tend to forget it. Um, but this is how they decide how they want users to join their portal. So if they want to invite people or if they want people to ask to join, um, that is their option. Um, let's see, we just got a few things left here. Um, so just some things that I wanted to mention that were additional resources and things that we encourage all of our organizations to take advantage of and that I hope that you will also encourage them to take advantage of. Um, the first is our school workshops. Uh, so throughout the semester, we'll have we're looking at having about three or four in-person sold workshops this semester. Our first is probably going to be a treasurer's training. Um, those are up on our website. Hey, I have a really quick question. We have class in here at 1. And yes, we are almost done. Great, it starts at 1. Yeah, it starts at 1. Okay, we are almost done. Okay, well, that's <laughs> terrible. Okay, then we'll get out of here. Cool, thanks. Um, 
Okay, so we have soul workshops. Um, encourage them to go there on our website, soonactivities.unit.edu.sold. Um, encourage them to sign up for Mean Green Fling, Mean Green Spin Fling, especially if they need to table um, and um, are looking to get new members. Um, we do have our Eagle Awards banquet in the spring in April, and we will be asking for nominations for um, individuals, officers. Um, they can um, nominate you all as advisors and our organizations for different Eagle Awards. So I would really encourage your organization um, to make sure they're nominating themselves and nom nominating those others uh, for those awards. Um, and then with CLS, we have a few um, things that we do. So All for NTNT for All is a leadership conference coming up. Um, we do leadership lunches for um, our student org officers and members. Uh, so those are something that we'll have coming soon. Uh, leadership is also a great um, opportunity for our org officers, and that is the last week, um, or in May, the week after finals. Um, so encourage them to sign up for that. Um, and then we also have some information on our website, studentactivities.ut.edu backslash advisors, where I'll put all of our workshops, um, our reception in April, which I hope you all will attend, and then we have our handbook and some other information on there as well. Um, so any questions? I know that they're dying to get in here. So if you have questions, we can meet outside too. Um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.